Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Measuring Molecular Interaction by Multi-Wavelength Analytical Ultracentrifugation. My name is Akash Bhattacharya, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoot and sponsored by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. The views expressed in this webinar are those of the speaker and not of Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. For more information on Beckman Coulter, please visit www.beckman.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. If you have trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Dr. Boris Demler, Professor and Canada 150 Research Chair for Biophysics at the, at the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Demler, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome, everybody. I'm Boris Demler, and I'm broadcasting today from the University of Lethbridge in beautiful southern Alberta. I will be discussing multi-wavelength analytical ultracentrifugation a new method for studying heterogeneous systems and molecular interactions. Analytical ultracentrifugation, or AUC for short, is a time-honored technique which was invented in the 1920s by Swedish physicist T. Swedberg. Swedberg uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work on dispersed systems and the invention of the analytical ultracentrifuge that was in 1926. If you ever visit the University of Uppsala in Sweden, where he worked, uh, stop by and visit his old laboratory, which is now a museum. There you will be able to find the original instrument used by Swedberg for his pioneering work. I, uh, I was there and visited it and took those two pictures you see here. Sometimes I wonder if uh, Swedberg would have imagined the staying power and the importance of this technique and how important it would be today, almost 100 years later. For many studies nowadays, AUC is considered the gold standard characterization tool. And with modern instruments available today, this is true now more than ever. So what can we learn from analytical ultracentrifugation? I'm going to give you some background here uh, for those people who are not familiar with AUC. So we're all on the same page. In uh, sedimentation velocity experiments, which is the prime type of experiment performed with analytical ultracentrifugation, uh, you uh, measure the sedimentation and the diffusion coefficient and the partial concentration of an analyte in a solution. If you perform what's called a density matching experiment, you can also access the partial specific volume of the analyte. And from all of this information together, we can then learn about a molecule size, molar mass, anisotropy, and density. Some people call it shape. I like to call it anisotropy because AUC really can't tell apart different shapes. All it can tell apart is the globularity or how extended the molecule is, and we'll call it anisotropy. It's a, a little bit more precise. So molecules can be studied in a physiological environment, which uh, is one of the big strengths of AUC. You can put your molecules in an environment that replicates the conditions inside of a cell. And the solution conditions can then be adjusted uh, where you can modulate uh, the concentration of the analyte 
maybe the effect of the pH by changing that. Uh, you can test the ionic strength or the type of buffer that you used for the purification to see if your molecule is stable in a buffer. You can add ligands and see what it does to your molecule, and you can even check what happens if you change the oxidation state of the solution by adding a reductant, or you can change the temperature and many other things. Uh, you have a very large size range uh, that you can access with analytical ultracentrifugation because um, uh, you can vary the speed of the uh, instrument and measure very, very small molecules at very high speed, such as even things like uh, salt ions would move uh, at very high speed. While um, at a slower speed, you could then measure particles as large as a, as a virus. Um, you can also access dynamics, uh, where you measure the oligomerization state of reversible self or hetero associations, where you can uh, follow the binding of ligands and uh, measure equilibrium constants, the KD, and even slow kinetics. You can do a composition analysis where you can take a mixture of molecules or an unknown molecule that's dissolved in a solution and you find out what is the number of components in there, what are their partial concentrations and each component's molecular weight and anisotropy. You can do a confirmation analysis, confirmational analysis where you follow the folding or the melting of uh, biopolymers and you can check how, um, whether a molecule is intrinsically disordered, uh, extended or whether it's well folded. And you can also change the solution properties and see how that affects the conformational change that the molecule might be experiencing. It's also an excellent method for characterizing any molecule or molecular interaction in the solution environment. You don't need um, a lot of material, only about a half a mil per sample, and uh, you can measure up to 16 samples in a single run. Um, so it's, I wouldn't say high throughput, but it's, it's fairly good throughput. And the analysis, and this is very important, is based on first principles. That is, all the transport that occurs inside of the ultra centrifuge um, is uh, well understood how it works. And so we can model this with differential equations, solve the equations, and then uh, simply fit the data to the equations uh, and get the right answer, provided the instrument is well calibrated. And so there are no external standards required. You don't need any reference materials in order to see um, what your molecule is doing. So uh, a little background about the instrumentation. So you need a rotor. Uh, these are made out of titanium and they either have four or eight holes. And the foil rotor can spin up to 60,000 RPM. So that's almost 300,000 G at the bottom of the cell. And in the holes, you put your samples. Uh, the samples are contained in a, uh, in a housing that gets capped at the top and the bottom by a sapphire window, and you can shine light through it. So here's the top view of one of those cells, and you can see that it has two compartments, both of them are sector shaped. That's where the sample goes. And if you blow up a, a sector, you can see that the solution column in there um, has a vertical meniscus because all the material gets pressed against the wall, so you have a vertical meniscus. And above it, you have a little air pocket. And um, inside of it, um, you have a concentration gradient as the material sediments towards the bottom of the cell and piles up there. Uh, to measure that, um, you shine light of a selected wavelength through the sample. And uh, you then watch uh, the absorbance that you can record below the sample of how much light actually passes through. And the observance then is proportional to the concentration at every point in the cell. You make multiple recordings over time and you get then a full sedimentation velocity experiment which has many scans. Uh, and each scan is a recording at a uh, different time point. So here's a simulation of this. You accelerate the rotor, the boundary starts moving, and it starts piling up at the bottom where it um, creates a very steep concentration gradient that causes it to diffuse back into the cell against the sedimenting, um, uh, or the sedimentation force. 
So all of those scans get recorded and then fitted to a um, equation. Uh, it's called the Lamb equation. It's a partial differential equation. And um, what it tells you is how the concentration changes over time at every point in the cell uh, or every radius in the cell. And it um, describes the, both the sedimentation and the diffusion transport. And you can see these two terms circled here in blue and in red. So this one is the sedimentation term. It'll give you the sedimentation coefficient and the diffusion coefficient from this term. And you fit this um, and, uh, to your experimental data and you obtain those two parameters as well as the concentration for each particle. This uh, Lamb equation then can be solved by the finite element method and it's described in this reference right here. This is a single wavelength experiment and uh, what you can obtain from such an experiment is maybe a molar mass distribution as a function of anisotropy as shown here where each solute in your mixture will represent another peak and the peaks have different heights according to the relative concentration of each uh, material. You can also show it here in this pseudo 3D plot where the color intensity reflects the height of the peak and um, a faint particle will not have a lot of material in it. And then um, after you go through all the uh, analysis, you then have the partial concentration of each solute, the sedimentation and diffusion coefficient, and uh, perhaps the partial specific volume if you did a density matching experiment. And uh, you obtain the molar mass. Um, if there are interactions between these molecules, you can uh, obtain the KD or even the off rate um, if the kinetics are slow, as well as the anisotropy. So let's talk about multi wavelength. So everything I've showed you so far um, refers to a um, single wavelengths uh, m being measured. So you dial in a, a particular wavelength and you watch for the absorbance uh, that is recorded um, when that single wavelength light, that monochromatic light passes through the sample. But um, it gets interesting when you measure the same sample at multiple wavelengths, because then uh, you will be able to also observe the spectral information that is contained in your sample in case the molecules that are there have different absorbance spectra. And this is what we're capitalizing on. This was described in uh, this Methods in Enzymology paper here from uh, 2015. Um, and um, it was work done in collaboration with my colleague, Professor Helmut Kurfen at the University of Constance in Germany. He invented this, um, this detector here, this multi-wavelength detector, that can record um, up to 1,024 wavelengths in, uh, in a single scan. So you can scan your cell, and instead of getting a single wavelength, you get 1,024 wavelengths, or the observance at 1,024 wavelengths. You can do something very similar with this instrument, uh, the new Optima AUC, which um, not only, um, well, it, it cannot collect all of the wavelengths all at the same time. It has to scan them one after another in a sequential fashion. But um, by doing that, it still can obtain all of the multi-wavelength information of, uh, that may be contained in your sample. So the good thing then is that for the first time, by doing um, a multi-wavelength analysis, you can achieve spectral separation between the chemical absorbance properties of your molecules in addition to the hydrodynamic separation of the different size species. And then both dimensions can be analyzed and utilized to interpret the underlying system properties. So here you see a typical multi-wavelength experiment. And this experiment then shows um, basically the absorbance uh, properties in this dimension. And then here, the traditional hydrodynamic dimension uh, which shows how the boundary moves in, um, in, the, in the radial domain. Here's the meniscus. And um, by looking at these two pictures, you can tell already that we're looking at two different chemicals here because they have different absorbance patterns. Here we have an absorbance at uh, 280, uh, a peak at 280, so this is most likely a protein. And it goes up here at 250, 240, it goes back up. And uh, here 
we look at the observance of a DNA molecule which has a peak at 260. Here's the movie of the same process. So you can see how different boundaries move at different rates. And um, what we can then do is take a uh, particular slice at one radial position or at any radial position here, uh, for example, right here. And what we get is a wavelength scan at this particular uh, position, because here we have all the wavelengths. And so this is, becomes a wavelength uh, scan of the chemical or the analyte that is sedimenting at this position in the cell. So what can we do with this information? If you have, for example, a, a mixture out of protein and DNA, then these would be the observances that you would see. So in this case, we have a protein called BSA, or bovine serum albumin, and a DNA molecule. In this case, it's a, it's a, it's a digest of a plasmid. The DNA is shown in red, and the protein molecule is shown in purple here. If you were to take these two molecules and you would mix them together at different ratios, you would get all the scans in between here. So for example, if you had a 50-50 mixture, you would see a shape of observance that looks like this green scan. And so immediately you can understand that by just looking at what this shape is, we can tell how much of each of these molecules is in there. And that's the principle of multi-wavelengths. Now, you can do this not just by eye, but also mathematically. And then you can separate out these two components by deconvoluting uh, the basis spectra from uh, these mixture spectra. And you can define how much of the red and how much of the purple is in any one of these. So how well that process works is determined by this equation, which essentially tells you the angle between the two vectors that we're looking at, one being the BSA and the other one being the DNA. So if you, if you make the dot product between the observance spectrum of DNA and the observance spectrum of BSA, and you divide it by the product of the magnitudes of each vector and then take the inverse cosine, you get this angle here. And this angle is zero if the two vectors are linearly dependent, uh, meaning they um, are essentially identical, uh, maybe just um, two scans at different concentrations of the same thing, that would be zero, this angle. But if you had two peaks that were completely separated, these ones are overlapping, as you can see, but if they were completely separated, like let's say one at 500 nanometers and one at 200 nanometers, and they would be baseline separated, then this angle would be 90 degrees or close to 90 degrees, meaning it's perfectly orthogonal. The closer this angle gets to 90 degrees, the easier it is to separate out these components and get these ratios correct, okay? And this equation will tell us how well they're separable. So our job is then to pick each one of these radial positions in each scan and decompose them. And this can be done with this method called NNLS, which basically finds the amplitude for each one of these spectral signatures here, in this case, DNA and BSA. And when we take these amplitudes for every radial point and every scan, we can reconstruct the original experiment, but with a complete optical separation between DNA and BSA. So here we record the amplitude um, of BSA, and here we record the amplitude of DNA. And these numbers are obtained by fitting our wavelength scan that we get here at each radial position. So of course, there's a lot of points to calculate, and then of course there are many scans. And so for each scan, we perform this procedure and we obtain these two two-dimensional data sets now. And um, uh, this process can be done all numerically and you'll get all your um, answers. If these observance profiles here are actually in molar extinction coefficients, then the concentrations here will be in molar units. So then you can compare molar quantities directly from your multi-wavelength experiment. 
So just to show you what the experiments looked like for these various mixtures that were um, shown the observance spectra for before, you can see that if you have 100% DNA and no BSA, then you essentially get a baseline signal here and you get uh, a fairly large contribution from your DNA. And here's 80%, 20%, you know, 50, 50, and so forth, until we get to 0% DNA and 100% BSA, now all the signal is blue and none of the signal is red. So as you can see, by looking at different mixtures, we can then uh, uniquely identify how much of each species is present. And when you do the complete analysis uh, for anisotropy and molar mass or sedimentation coefficient, you will get a baseline separation of the DNA contribution and the protein contribution. So BSA is a molecule that forms a monomer, a dimer, and a trimer, and you can see those very clearly separated here. And they're all fairly globular molecules, so they don't have a very high uh, anisotropy. But the DNA, which is a long linear uh, uh, molecule, these are double-stranded DNA fragments. There's a 12 base pair fragment, a 208 base pair fragment, and a 28-11 base pair fragment. So this one is um, has a much higher anisotropy because it's very extended, very long molecule. This one is somewhere in the middle here at around three. And then we also see these things up here. So these are uh, somewhat ill-defined pieces of DNA, which are either uncut plasmids or concatomers, or they could also be pieces of chromosomal uh, DNA that's all super curled and twisted together and therefore appears more or less um, spherical. So by being able to distinguish DNA and protein merely by their colors here, we can then totally be sure that this particle right here is not some aggregate of the protein, but some sort of an aggregate of DNA. So um, you get a very clear separation between these species and even those that are very close together in S are very clearly separated. And not just in color, but also by anisotropy. They're very different anisotropies. So we can figure this out. If you do the same experiment with a single wavelength um, mode in the uh, old uh, Proteome Lab XLA, um, this is the type of picture you get there. So you see you have much less resolution and a lot more noise, and it's really hard to tell which one is which. And you can't be very definitive about it. Here's your um, uh, differential S value distribution. All of these peaks are basically running together, while over here they're completely baseline separated from each other. One of them is red, one of them is blue. This is DNA, this is BSA. So you can immediately appreciate the wealth of information that we can get uh, by doing a multi wavelength experiment. We can separate these two signals completely. While in the old single wavelength method, everything is sort of bunched together and hard to tell which is which. So the multi-wavelength analysis is supported by the UltraScan software which is developed in my group. And uh, as you can imagine, when you have 1,024 data sets, uh, rather than just one, the computational requirements go up and that is a challenge for the analysis software. So by having this increased data density, um, we have now data sets that are much larger because multiple wavelengths need to be fitted simultaneously. Um, on the Optima AUC, you have approximately 1,400 data points if you measure the entire length of the cell. Uh, about 1.4 centimeters with 10 micron resolution gives you about 1,400 data points. And then uh, if you use the Beckman software, you can collect 20 wavelengths in one experiment. Uh, with UltraScan, you can get up to 100 um, in the Optima AUC, although that takes quite a while to get a single scan, um, but it is doable. And uh, in the Curfin optics, where all of the wavelengths are measured simultaneously in parallel, you get 1,024 wavelengths from a single scan. So um, the number of scans um, in the Optima is restricted to 1,500 scans per wavelength. And the data size then, uh, if you multiply it all together, uh, 1,400 points per radius times, uh, um, times 100 uh, wavelengths times 1,500 data points, um, uh, or scans, I should say, uh, times four bytes per point, uh, 
we're getting close to 84 um, or 0.84 gigabytes just for the for the single data set, right? Uh, in the Optima AUC's experiments, uh, where you have it uh, collected in binary format in the Open AUC Ultra Scan uh, data format. So uh, if you do this in, in ASCII format, like the uh, legacy software packages use, uh, it'll be a huge multiple of that in terms of size. So, um, but in the Open AUC Ultra Scan data format, everything is binary, which compresses the data down significantly. The uh, Optima AUC um, data also require a time synchronization step because, of course, all wavelengths are acquired sequentially. So they're not collected at the same time. And therefore, it would be difficult to get your wavelength scan since you can't really align them. Everyone, every scan, um, every wavelength scan was acquired at a different time. So UltraScan will interpolate the, two, uh, the, the data back uh, by doing a 2DSA model of this and then creating a synchronous time grid where you can recreate the wavelengths domain so you can actually obtain the wavelengths out of these data. This step is not required if you use the Cofin optics and which can of course get everything at the same time. So that's a big benefit there. So, UltraScan uh, then to analyze all of these data uses a, um, uh, a parallel uh, analysis platform um, where data is stored in MySQL database on a LIM server. Um, there is an infrastructure available in the US and in Europe. Uh, in the US is provided by Exceed and in Europe by Price that provide high performance computing cluster where all of this information can be analyzed in parallel on big uh, supercomputers. And uh, there is a grid middleware that uh, brokers all the requests to the different supercomputers uh, that uh, is called Aravata, and that's part of the system. Um, for users that uh, do not want to use these academic environments uh, where they have to move the data outside of the uh, uh, own four walls, uh, we also offer an ultra scan in the box high end server where all of these uh, items are basically in one big server uh, combined that can be directly hooked up to your Optima in your own uh, company, uh, corporate environment, and keep your data all saved there. So that's another option for doing this. So um, we also have to talk about experimental design considerations. Uh, for the Optima AUC, uh, as I already mentioned, the data are collected sequentially of all wavelengths. The scanning speed is dependent on the rotor speed and should be optimized to achieve perfect synchronization with the flash lamp flashing rate timing. So when the rotor hole comes by, you want to be able to flash. At certain speeds, especially the, the slower speeds, a change in just 100 RPM can actually double the scanning speed because instead of getting a uh, the, the window directly below the lamp, um, the rotor has moved just a little bit too far and you have to wait a whole nother revolution of the rotor before you can flash again. So that will make it almost twice as long uh, for, the, uh, for the scanning speed. So by uh, judiciously picking the right rotor speed, you can optimize this and then get very close to 15 seconds uh, per scan per cell. And uh, that means it scanned both the A and the B channel, which is about seven and a half seconds per channel. And uh, we measured all of that. And in UltraScan, this is all pre-programmed, so you can see how much speed you get or scanning speed you get for each RPMs that you pick. So you pick the speed and I'll tell you how long it will take to scan uh, the cell. So by picking a rotor speed then, that is maybe 100 RPM slower, um, you can then uh, optimize your design and maximize the number of scans that you can get um, out of the machine. Uh, secondly, you should always scan two samples. If you recall, the cell has two channels, so you might as well put two samples in it because you can't tell it to just scan channel A or channel B. It will always scan both channels. So regardless, you might as well take advantage of that by putting a second sample in there. But um, all data in the Optima are acquired in intensity mode uh, and you should not request observance data because that will degrade the quality of your data uh, 
uh, due to the noise vector convolution. You get noise from the reference and you get noise from your sample and adding them together will essentially give you a square root of two increase in stochastic noise, very undesirable. And so um, you want to want to avoid that, you know, otherwise you get 1.4 times more of the noise. Um, and secondly, of course, it preempts the use of the second channel for another sample because you would have to put buffer into it. Ultrascan will calculate the baseline that you get from your buffer, so you don't even need to measure it. It can be calculated. Um, you should only measure a single cell if you have a lot of wavelengths to scan. Uh, this way you can maximize all of the scans and focus them just on that cell, rather than um, measuring multiple scans and having to wait until, uh, multiple cells, and having to wait on all of them are finished. So maximize the number of scans that you can obtain for, for each wavelength. Um, if the sample sediments very rapidly, you may have to reduce the rotor speed than what you would use in a single wavelength experiment, just so you have enough time so all of the, all of the scans can be collected before the sample is pelleted. And you should also carefully match the concentrations that you measure and the wavelengths that you collect um, to avoid exceeding the dynamic range of your detector at all wavelengths. So depending on the wavelengths that you use, the dynamic range extends from about 0.05 OD to about 1.5 OD. Um, it could be less at a wavelength where you have less intensity. And the optimal signal to noise is typically around somewhere around, obtained somewhere around uh, 0.6 OD. So now let's look at some uh, experiments that um, were actually done with multi wavelengths. Uh, this paper uh, came out in uh, 2016, I believe. And um, it uh, described the interaction of West Nile virus RNA um, with a host protein called TR, uh, human T cell restricted intercellular antigen 1 related protein, which causes infectivity. And the questions were what is the binding strength and why does it outcompete cellular RNA? And as you can see here, um, the uh, ITC signal was not very nice, and it just never really came back to baseline, even at a six molar ratio. So that, that was when this group at uh, Georgia State University from Marcus Gelman and uh, Margot Brinton and, and the postdoc Jin Zhang um, asked us to help them with this, and Helmut and Joe uh, in, in uh, uh, and Constance ran the experiments and reanalyzed it. So we ran a multi-wavelength experiment and we decomposed into the signal of the protein, the RNA, and also the buffer which did absorb. It didn't sediment, so you just get baseline absorbance, but the signal nevertheless needs to be deconvoluted out as well. So here's your RNA signal and here's your protein signal. And now, I'm sorry, this, uh, the, the RNA signal is in blue and the protein in red. And when you measure the two molecules by themselves, you get just boring single peaks, meaning there are no dimers or anything like that. They're just single component species. There's a little bit of degradation here with the RNA. But when you mix them together, uh, you get a shift in S and you get this really broad boundary here. And you get about a two to one ratio of the protein signal over the uh, uh, RNA signal. And so the question is, what is this? Why, are there so, why is this so broad, this peak? And it turns out this is a reaction boundary. There are several association states, and you see sort of the weight average of all of them. And as you increase the protein concentration, in this case, we're, we're measuring 3 to 1, and here we measure 6 to 1, uh, you get a further shift to the right, and the peak becomes somewhat more narrow. And uh, also what you see is you see a change of the ratio of protein to RNA going to about four to one. And if you increase it even further and add tenfold the amount of protein than uh, RNA, uh, you stay with this peak, it shifts a little bit further to the right, it goes from about 7.9 to about 8.6. And you get a very narrow peak, again with a four to one ratio, but you also see that there's material piling up over here, which is your free protein that is not bound. So all the RNA is consumed, but there's excess protein in here, 
and that can't bind to anything, so it just makes a, another peak, just like if you ran it by itself. So that kind of shows you what happens in an association. So here, we clearly have co-sedimenting species and that form a complex. Otherwise, they wouldn't all be sedimenting at the same position. And uh, you can look at this in this format here, and you can integrate the peaks, and you get a um, calculation for the molar mass. Knowing what the ratio is 4 to 1, you can then also calculate a partial specific volume. And with this calculated specific volume, you can then get a molar mass. And from that molar mass, you can then derive the ratio as well. If we just have the observance ratio, which is 1 to 4, we don't really know if it's 2 to 8 or 4 to 16 or something like that um, until we do the, the hydrodynamics. So you also need the hydrodynamics. And in this case, it turns out we get a molar mass of about 152,000. The theoretical molar mass of a 1 to 4 complex is 151, 285. So this is very close. So there's no way this is anything else but a 1 to 4. I mean, it's definitely not a 2 to 8, and for sure not a 16 or a, a, a 4 to 16 or something like that. So it would have to be a 1 to 4. So this is what you get out of this. You get a very unambiguous calculation of your molar ratio of this complex and how big it is. The next experiment that I want to tell you was done by Chris Horn. In, um, uh, Ren uh, uh, Dobson's lab at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Uh, he actually came to visit us here in Lethbridge and uh, brought his samples with them and ran it on the Optima. And what he has is this transcriptional regulator called NAN-R from E. coli that um, uh, binds a DNA fragment here. And uh, this uh, binding was what he was studying of this NAN-R to the DNA. So here, um, he started out doing some uh, uh, binding assays, uh, gel shift assays, by adding more and more of the protein to his DNA template. And he noticed how he gets additional species formed here that um, are complexes of the protein together with his DNA. Um, doing a multi-wavelength experiment, he measured the molar extinction coefficient of the DNA and the molar extinction coefficient of the protein at a wavelength range starting at 220 going up to about 320. And um, then he was trying to obtain evidence for um, number one, is this monomeric or dimeric as it binds? And then how many of these copies bind to these recognition sites that are on this DNA template. Uh, doing the experiment again by themselves, each sample by itself, he gets the DNA here, um, sedimenting around 2.8, and the, uh, uh, the protein sedimenting around 3.9. Uh, nice homogeneous single peaks. But when they mix together, you see a shift occur, and both the RNA and the protein um, uh, absorb in a molar ratio here shown. Um, and the S values shift. So we have a complex formed. We have free protein and free DNA, and then we have complexes that again make a broad uh, reaction boundary as multiple proteins bind to um, this DNA template. When you increase the protein concentration, um, you get, uh, you lose the, the one, one, uh, one to one, and you only see the two and the three to uh, one uh, binding complex here. And finally, at very high concentration, you saturate out uh, all the DNA that's there, just like we did in the West Nile virus experiment. And you get a, a ratio that indicates that uh, six monomers bind to one DNA template. And this was a 10 to one uh, mixture, so we ended up getting some excess free protein formed over here. So uh, that's another um, way of how you can um, analyze uh, these somewhat complex systems and get very high resolution information. The next example um, is to show you how you could um, uh, introduce spectral variety by fusing your protein to 
uh, various fluorescent proteins, which now come in all kinds of colors, as you can see over here. And uh, when you calculate the uh, separation between these colors, uh, you get very large uh, angles here. Uh, so for, for your reference, a protein and a DNA molecule would be closer to maybe 35. These are almost twice as big. And so we get good separation between these. Um, if you just pick the um, um, orthogonal regions, you can squeeze this even higher, this angle, and get even better separation. And so what we did is take two of these proteins, mix them together at different ratios, and then ask the questions, how well can we recover those ratios? Very similar with the DNA and the BSA experiment. And as you can see, you know, here's a one-to-one, -one, we get pretty much the same height. Uh, here's a one-to-three, so we get three times higher peak for that one. And here's a five-to-one, so we have a five times higher peak of this one versus that one. So, um, what that tells you is that if you were to fuse your protein that is interacting with another protein with a different um, uh, fluorophore or fluorescent protein in this case, the absorbance that you get from these fluorescent proteins can then be used to introduce this spectral variety that helps you differentiate the interactions of these molecules. Here's another example of where we mix three of them together, three different ones. And um, the twist here is, is that two of them were added at exactly the same amount, and they also have exactly the same size. This one here, which is uh, um, uh, the, the ultramarine uh, fluorescent protein, um, it behaves as a constituent dimer, so it always sediments faster than the monomeric fluorescent proteins. All the fluorescent proteins are essentially the same molar mass, so you get the same peak, and if you mix them at the same ratio, you also get the same height of these, and uh, uh, which basically tells you that, uh, that uh, all of these species, even if they have exactly the same S value, can be 100% resolved because of their spectrum. That all these experiments were done on the Optima. And so you can get very, very clean results um, separating out exactly which component is which, even if they have the same hydrodynamics. So let's apply this to some experiments. Um, uh, so here we have um, a molecule called cytochrome C, which um, contains a heme group. So that provides it um, in the presence of um, zinc, actually fluorescence, but it also emits or it absorbs in the visible. So cytochrome C is sort of reddish uh, and absorbs at about 410. So um, what we've done here is try to figure out if there's an interaction with cardiolipin between cytochrome C, uh, with cytochrome C. And so we made uh, cardiolipin membranes uh, by embedding them in nanodisks. And if you measure cytochrome by itself, it's a small molecule at sediments like this blue curve right here. The nanodisks have a belt protein, uh, APOE, which um, sort of makes a circle and then allows it to reconstitute lipids in the middle and making this nice disc. And this uh, shape, of course, is bigger in the molar mass, so it sediments faster, and there's some heterogeneity here, as shown in the green curve. So the green curve was measured just at 280, uh, looking for the um, tryptophan here in this APOE belt protein. Now, when you put the cytochrome C in there, you can see that the cytochrome C all of a sudden sediments much faster. This is cytochrome C, a limited amount of, but there's some excess of cytochrome C added. So we have some free cytochrome C that's not binding. But you can very clearly see that this material here actually binds, and there may actually be more than one cytochrome C bound to this nanodisc here. So you can measure the binding of your protein to a lipid which I think is pretty cool. Here's an uh, even more cool experiment. If you look at cytochrome C in the oxidized or reduced form, you can see that they have very different spectra. Okay, so the blue is the reduced form and the red is the oxidized form. So in the reduced form, you get this very uh, 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 characteristic, oops, let me just go back, characteristic double peak here around between 500 and 550 nanometers. So just using these uh, regions here that are very different, 
we can then make a, um, a measurement on, of, and follow the cytochrome C that's oxidized and follow the cytochrome C that's reduced. And lo and behold, they behave differently when they bind to the cardiolipin uh, nanodisc. It turns out that when um, what we're doing is probing the apoptosis that's triggered by cytochrome C. So the idea would be that cytochrome C might degrade the, um, uh, the, uh, the nanodisc, or the, the membrane at least. So what's happening is um, that if we look at the oxidized form, we get this very broad uh, boundary showing uh, essentially many different sizes of lipids that are bound. So this would suggest that maybe the oxidized form uh, causes um, a uh, degradation of the membrane and then causes this heterogeneity. However, the reduced form doesn't seem to have that. It's very, very homogeneous. And it just shows the nanodisc and the cytochrome C bound to the nanodisc, but it doesn't do anything. It stays intact. So the oxidized and the reduced form behave very differently and have a very different profile. Something you can learn by doing a multi-wavelength analysis. Another way you can um, utilize multi-wavelengths is by uh, following um, the loading of nanoparticles with, for example, RNA. If you look at the RNA spectrum, uh, it doesn't absorb at all until you get to about 260, you get a peak there. Nanodisks, or I should say um, lipid micelles, and um, uh, in this case, lipid nanoparticles, um, they don't absorb, but they uh, give you a pseudo absorbance from the light scattering that they create, which uh, increases with decreasing wavelengths. And using that signature and then looking at a nanodisc that's felt, you get a signature of the um, uh, of this deviation here, where the RNA actually absorbs. So these lipid nanoparticles have RNA in them, uh, and that's shown in blue. If you analyze this in the multi-wavelength experiment, you can then get um, a separation of particles based on their density because they sediment with different rates once they contain some RNA. And uh, you can then follow that um, and look at the signatures that you get from the spectral resolution and find out that they indeed contain RNA. That same principle also works with AAV or other viral vectors, which are basically uh, composed out of protein and a nucleic acid, and then you can measure how much nucleic acid is in there by using that same principle. And uh, the last example that I'm going to show you here is um, that uh, where you go the other way. What if you don't know what the absorbent spectrum is, and you have a mixture of things that absorb at different wavelengths, but you really don't know what these components are? So what you see here on the left is essentially a sedimentation profile that shows you where it's absorbing. So we obtain an absorbance uh, profile from the materials that we separate out hydrodynamically. So we're going basically in the reverse. And what you see here is a sample that was extracted out of all seeds. And the all seeds, this is a big business here in Alberta, uh, like rapeseed and uh, canola and so forth, they contain polyphenols, which are small molecules that are uh, absorbed in the visible. And so you see these small molecules here around 1S, these are the polyphenols. And the question here was, uh, what proteins do we have and are they bound to polyphenols? And as you can see very clearly, there's very little, if any, polyphenol bound to this protein. And same here, there's another protein, there's less of it there, uh, so it's about 2S but it's also not bound to the polyphenols, which sediment separately as the spectrum shows. Here's one where you have a protein and DNA mixture. Here's a characteristic protein sedimenting at about 5S, and here's a DNA uh, that sediments at about 12S. And so they have very different spect spectra, and so you can see that here by just looking at the spectral signature of the sedimentation profile. So this is another thing you can do here. Now, um, I want to summarize my talk uh, by giving you an overview of the benefits that we get from multi-wavelength experiments. So instead of a single wavelength, now many wavelengths can be collected. Uh, you can resolve multiple chromophores that may be present in a, uh, in a mixture. 
And you can then therefore characterize much more complex mixtures um, by uh, either decomposing the, um, the different chromophores that are in there or showing the sedimentation profile and uh, showing basically what the absorbance profile is. And the increased data density for multiple uh, wavelengths results in a better signal to noise ratio as we saw with the DNA and the BSA mixture where we get very clean signal and not all the scattered data from the XLA. So you get, because you measure so much more data, you get a higher signal to noise ratio. Um, therefore, you can uh, answer new and exciting questions. You can invest, make new investigations that weren't possible before. Uh, so this is very exciting. And with the new hardware that we have from Beckman, that Optima AUC, uh, you have this whole thing available commercially and you can do it yourself. And with the high performance computing that you have available through uh, UltraScan, you can address these multi wavelength data challenges that we have. And uh, oops, wrong, wrong direction. Multi wavelength applications include protein nucleic acid interactions, proteins with fluorescent protein fusions, like for example, GFP or RFP or YFP. And you can also use fluorescent tags if there's enough. Uh, tag on there, you get enough of an extinction that you can follow that as well. Or you can use proteins which have intrinsic chromophores, uh, maybe in the visible range where they wouldn't overlap with the UV spectrum. For example, a heme does that. Uh, there could be others. Uh, mixtures containing small interacting molecules like drugs, for example, that may have a very strong absorbance in the UV and that may be different from protein absorbance. So that could be followed as well. Uh, you can study nanoparticle loading, viral vector loading, and the separation of spectrally distinct solutes in mixtures for composition identification. So um, I'm at the end of my talk and I just would like to put in a quick plug for the 25th International AUC Conference, which will take place July 11th through 16th uh, next year, next summer. Here in Lethbridge, um, we will be hosting at uh, please mark your calendar and follow this website right here, auc2021.ulath.ca, uh, for any updates. And I want to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions that we can't answer here today, feel free to send them to my personal email, dmla.gmail.com. And I would also like to credit some of my collaborators um, in my group, uh, Emery Brooks, Gary Gorbett, Kip J, and Alexis Savelyev have uh, done the programming on the UltraScan software. My daughter a Aisha was uh, involved in the analysis of the BSA and uh, uh, DNA mixtures. Um, Amy runs our lab here and helped with all of the other experiments that you saw if she didn't do them herself, as does Christiana and uh, Marielle. Harmon um, is, uh, was postdoc in my lab and worked on the cytochrome C sample. Uh, also together with Sandy Ross and Bruce Bolo from the University of Montana. Wyoming Chow at the University of Texas in San Antonio um, helped us with the finite element solutions and uh, Helmut Kölfen, Joe Pearson, Engen Karabuda developed the multi-wavelength detector of the first generation, the Kölfen optics, um, that can acquire all the data all at once. Uh, at Georgia State University, the group of uh, Marcus Gamma and Margot Brink, uh, Brenton were involved with the West Nile virus study. And the NAN-R um, uh, protein uh, DNA interaction was done by Chris Horn and Renrick Dobson's lab at the University of Canterbury. And at the University of British Columbia, we're working together with Peter Cullis and Joe Korkani and Dominic uh, Ritzigman uh, to study the lipid nanoparticles. And I want to also thank Eric von Segerin from Beckman Coulter Engineering, uh, who helped us uh, with the data acquisition uh, integration of UltraScan on the Optima. We have funding from the National Science Foundation, the NIH, uh, TerraGrid Exceed for the high performance computing allocations, um, Canada Foundation for Innovation, uh, the National Science and Engineering Research Council in Canada, Alberta Innovates, and the Canadian uh, uh, Institute for Health research. So we want to appreciate, all, we, I want to thank all of those and appreciate uh, their support. And finally, I'd like to show a disclaimer page that Beckman asked me to show.
And uh, thank you again for your interest and uh, hope to see you again sometime. Thank you, Dr. Demler, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. All right, so let's get started. Our first question is, how many wavelengths can you acquire with the Optima AUC and what limitations exist? So uh, the number of wavelengths that you can acquire uh, depends on which software you use. If you use the Beckman software, um, you can collect 20 wavelengths per uh, channel. With the uh, Ultrascan software, you can go up to 100. However, there are limitations, and the limitations are primarily dictated by the by the scanning speed uh, with which you can collect the data. Since all wavelengths are collected sequentially, you need to allow for time to uh, collect all of the wavelengths that you want to measure. And the more wavelengths you collect, the longer it will take per scan. So if you were to measure 100 wavelengths, it would really take a long time uh, to get to the second scan because you have to scan all the 100 wavelengths for uh, for the first scan and then the second scan and so forth. So uh, the number of scans that you will get for each individual wavelength will decrease. And there's another limitation, which is that for each wavelength that you want to collect, um, the uh, instrument has to do uh, a calibration at the beginning of the run, which takes about a minute per wavelength. So you can, well, maybe not that long, but it'll take a, a certain amount of time which will delay the start of the scanning. So um, it, is, it depends on the experimental conditions, how slow you can run and how much resolution you need from your experiment in order to decide how many wavelengths are practical to be collected on the Optima. Thank you. Okay, let's go on to the next question, Dr. Demler. Uh, here goes. I'm studying a protein plus small molecule system I have recorded one experiment with absorbance data acquired at 280 nanometers and another experiment with absorbance data acquired at 490 nanometers, which is my small molecule absorption maximum peak. Now, can I acquire these two independent experiments? Uh, sorry, can I combine these two independent experiments for multivalent analysis? Yes, in principle, uh, that's perfectly uh, adequate to do that. The question is whether it's sufficient uh, to get a separation, and that depends on the spectrum of the protein or, or the molecule and, uh, and the other interacting component, the small molecule. And uh, if they don't have any overlaps or if the um, uh, resolution, or I should say the separation of the spectra is sufficient as described in my talk, um, then uh, this will work. Otherwise, you will have to add additional wavelengths to make the separation more distinct. So it really depends on the angle uh, between the two, two spectra that you have. So it, it should be as large as possible. So uh, an extension of that question is the next one. Is there any way that I can incorporate the interference data which I've acquired at the same time as a 260 as well as the 280 nanometer absorbance experiment. As in, can I use the intensity data set as a pseudo wavelength data set and then incorporate it into the multi wavelength analysis? No, not really. Um, the problem with that is, is that you don't really know what the refractive index is of every species in your mixture. And uh, what you see is essentially a collection of all of the uh, Refractive indices um, in the uh, in the mixture at every point in the in the cell, and uh, since there is no way to optically deconvolute them and assign like let's say molar concentrations to them, um, this is an unreliable way of adding information, and uh, it, it's it's really not a good way to to perform your multi wavelength experiment. 
Okay, so as an extension of that question, Dr. Demler, again, uh, since each component has to be fingerprinted via a UV-Viz spectrophotometer in order to do really good multi-wavelength analysis, supposing we had a way to specifically say that we have components X, Y, and Z in our uh, samples, which have the refractive indices of R1, R2, and R3, uh, which are recorded independently, not in the AUC instrument. Would that help? Um, it's it's not really uh, the way the software is designed to be able to uh, incorporate that data. That is not what we're trying to do here. We're just uh, looking at the um, observance spectra for which we have precise molar um, molar descriptions for each of the uh, species at every wavelength that is being measured. If we had that for the for the refractive indices uh, of all of the species, um, uh, maybe there is a way to include that, but the software is not designed to handle that. All right. Uh, there's one more question we have time for, and it is this. Is there a trade-off between spectral angle and the number of wavelengths to give a good result? Well, in general, the larger the angle, the better. And uh, it just depends on how much resolution and how much separation you really expect to uh, uh, to have and you need in order to uh, conclusively decide what uh, species the spectrum should be assigned to or the concentration should be assigned to. So the more species you include, uh, the more wave, the more uh, species with different spectra you're trying to deconvolute from your from your system, the more separation you should have. If you just have two species like protein and DNA, you can go to fairly low angles and still get satisfactory results. So um, in general, what you want to do is look for those regions in the spectrum where you get the most difference and then pick those wavelengths and include those and then use that uh, angle calculator and ultra scan to figure out um, uh, how much difference you can uh, uh, get from uh, different combinations of wavelengths, and then just simply pick the one with the smallest number and the smallest number of wavelengths and the largest uh, degree of separation, and those will be the best ones to use. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, it seems that we have run out of time, so I want to remind our audience that the questions we were unable to answer today and those that will be coming in to us during the on-demand period that the presentation will be available on LabRoots will all be answered by Dr. Tembler and sent to you at the email address you provided at the time of registration. Uh, Dr. Tembler, do you have any final comments for our audience? Well, I'd just like to say that uh, we feel that multi-wavelength is a uh, an exciting new toolbox for AUC and uh, that there will likely be many more uh, important applications that can be solved with it. And so I'd like you to think about how you might be able to incorporate it into your own uh, research as well. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you, Dr. Demler. So before we, uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to thank the audience today for joining us and for their amazing questions. Uh, again, we will try to get to all of the questions that you've submitted via the question box and answer you uh, directly uh, to the email address that you used at the time of registration. And we want to thank Dr. Demler again for his time today and for his many, many contributions to AUC research. And we'd also like to extend our thanks to LabRoots as well as our sponsor, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you for joining us again. Goodbye. Have a nice day.